my life is some shit. <laughs> you don't even know. Like, you got to think. Like, like, my life is so crazy. Like, my life's so crazy that I have to downplay it to people because they're going to think it's fake. What's up, it's your boy the NOC, aka DJ Maserati Knock, and of course this is Real Spit, you know what I mean, connecting with the artists and the, um, the trendsetters of Cincinnati, you know what I'm saying, not just Cincinnati, but Art City and beyond. Right now I got the homie with me, Mr. B-Love, how you doing sir? Um, I'm not much, man. First of all, uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedule, you know what I'm saying, the politics with us. Uh, we've been knowing each other for years in terms of me working at the radio station, you know what I'm saying, you doing music and different events um, in the city. Um, this is our way of, one, showing respect for the work that you've done, the work that you are doing, you know what I'm saying, making noise in the city and everything like that, and bringing a, a different element, a different flavor, man. Appreciate it, man. You know, we, you know, we go way back, so it's like, when you call me, it wasn't a big deal, man. I just. Got a lot of shit going on right now, but we gonna make it happen. Right, <laughs> as long as you're busy, you know what I'm saying. You're doing something. So for sure. let's talk about man your uh, your early start, man. Cincinnati with the music, man. How was that like? Um, like where the, at the very beginning, I probably start rapping about like nine, ten years old, because my brother, my brother had a record label here. In Cincinnati it was called Bo Hustle Records. Like they had like a little name for themselves. They was doing shit around the city, they was doing concerts and all that. So, you know, you got an older brother, you're gonna wanna be, basically follow their footsteps and do everything they want, that they do. So, my brother probably was my lead influence on everything that I did in my life. So, I started rapping and doing what he was doing. And I first, it started off with me just going around repeating his raps. Like, I didn't even know how to rap raps, but my friends didn't know who my brother was, so I was going around rapping his raps to them and they were I was impressed like, oh, oh yeah yeah I'm going around the hood clowning with his raps I don't even know what most of them mean but I know I'm saying all the words when I'm getting the reaction I want like, so then I got a little older um, and I start I start learning how to put it together myself around like seventh grade I did my first talent show that's where was that I, at? Uh, I went to Dater I went to Dater middle school mm -hmm. And that's where I met like different people that was influential, like Means, Means you know, Black On. Yeah. That was one of my best friends growing up. And uh still to this day. And I met B Chubb there. Yeah. Chubb. Chubb. Chubb actually did we, we wasn't allowed to have like I don't know if we wasn't allowed or if uh if some of the school. Uh we didn't have like the radio to play the beats through, like we didn't have the PA system. So Chubb actually did the beats for us perform at the talent show okay. actually on the drum set like okay. so he did the soundtrack to my to my first uh performance and I rap and I clown like so after that it was basically solidified like a little kid. Um after that I guess <laughs> we got up to like ninth grade, tenth grade and that's when shit like Jada Kiss and uh, Cassie, Cassie and them, they had came out around when it was like ninth grade and they was more on the punchline side so that was the kind of like being lyrical that was the kind of rap I was into because any, anything that you can listen to and make you be like ooh or like, oh, you didn't get it the first time you heard it so I'm like that yeah, really, twice. yeah like that yeah. really that really did something to me so I started rapping like that I started gearing out my raps that way mm -hmm. so around freshman year or something like we were just going around to different schools battling people and like that's how I met most of the rappers. Like I had I was going to different football games and stuff, we played football, going to basketball games that was packed and stuff and just getting in face to face battles with people that was at the battles like Butter and K I D and all them, they all had different names at the time and stuff like but it was people like uh my boy Celeb, Free Celeb, um 
That's a, that, like back then it wasn't you no know, Facebook and right. Instagram and a million rap niggas just sp spamming you every minute, telling you to listen to this. Like you really had to actually go outside. Right. Like, yeah. So that it was better then because it wasn't an oversaturation of rappers. Like right now, everybody think we just rap. Like niggas just want to start rapping when nothing else works in life. Like, mm. like it wasn't like that then. Like you really had to have something going on, and everybody was actually talking about something at the time. You really had to fine tune your craft. For too. sure, cause yeah. I ain't gonna lie, we were real kids and people was like, they was, you were saying shit that 15 and 6 year olds, 16 shouldn't even know. Right, right. Like when I met, like when I met Butter, like dude was 15 years old, I was 16 years old. Like we rapping, like we shouldn't even know the stuff that we know. <laughs> like it was, we was way more advanced than right. like 30 year old rappers right now. And, uh, so, yeah, so basically, the battle rapping, that, that kind of got me my name in the city, like, and um, around, like, my 11th, 12th grade year, it was stuff going on where uh, every week the Ritz had, like, um, they had battles at the Ritz. Right. It was freestyle battle, so every week somebody would come up there and get on stage and then it was, like, a little mini tournament. I know Mains was winning for weeks. E check was winning for weeks. I was winning for some weeks. I think Monty Burns was winning for some weeks. Like, that's where most of the early people got their name from because it was like everybody can't come up here. It was like it was more difficult and stuff. Yeah. I'm saying there need to be more platforms for people who are more serious about this stuff that you will weed out. Just like SoundCloud can't they can't stop anyone from coming on there. Like yeah. YouTube, you can't stop anyone from coming on there. And it's so crazy because like we were like the first like the way we came out, like 2010, so mm -hmm. like, we were like the first people that were like blowing up on YouTube for like yeah. 2008, 2010 stuff. Now it's not uncommon for these little guys that ain't they never even been out of their neighborhood for real, but they got 500, 600 thousand views on mm -hmm. YouTube. Like, that's yeah. ridiculous. Like we, well, 500 thousand views in 2008 would have been like 10 million right now. Like <laughs> that, that's that that ain't that's unheard of. Like Bob, he doing. His song on SoundCloud just did nine million views. He, you can call him though. He right here. Yeah. It ain't even. A, it, it don't even make sense. Like we supposed to be out of here. Like these guys. It's getting higher. It's getting a higher level every generation. But it's like nobody's still breaking through, and we gotta break them through because it don't make no sense. Like how can a guy be here every day in the streets of Cincinnati, but got nine million views on Spotify? Yeah. Like we we need more resources and. We, we don't have them right now, so everybody got to work harder to try to make them. Well, I mean, when, when you talk about resources, like, you know what I'm saying, even starting off then to 2010, 2005, 2000, like, the grind back then was totally different than it was now. So, mm -hmm. like, the resources are, are becoming more readily available. The research was. The, 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 like, the platforms, yeah, the platforms are becoming more readily mm -hmm. available, but it's also becoming, it's, coming harder to be somebody because with the platform being available it's an oversaturation of people trying to do it so now people treat rap like it's like yo yo safety net like when mm. nothing else make it for you in life and now you rap like get the fuck out of here dude I don't, I'm not trying to hear nobody who's sitting in the house and become a rapper and send a song out on Facebook and mm. no bro like we was actually out here like people actually know us we had you can follow our backstory and stuff so we weren't really thinking like my whole early days, I wasn't ever thinking about making a song. <laughs> like, that wasn't even nothing. We was just trying to write the best words because somebody would pull up on us like, yeah, somebody across town, they this and this and this, and I got $1,000 on you, come on, let's go get this money, and we go do that. So it wasn't even about no song and stuff until uh, we graduated. By this time, I'm with E-Checking them every day. Like, E-Check is in B game now. Like, yeah. we, uh, we all came from the same school for real, so me, E check, B Chub, uh, a bunch of other guys at B Game. We uh, the Chub and Chub and Nell them had already started a group called B Game, and then we came on later as like a little sub group or whatever. Like I was like one of the last people in B Game. After school ended, we started hanging up at the B Game house, and now we into the process of recording songs. Like Check was the only one recording songs at first. Like, Check had an album out while we were still in high school. The whole city knew about it. The Attic Boys, yeah, we're all doing their thing, man, and all that. Check had a solo album. He was more advanced than the rest of us. So I just started making songs after school. And then it got to the point where we started knowing, like, all right, it's about to, to get to the next level. We got to make songs like, that people can, that people want to buy and, and 
dancing. Yeah, you know, yeah. So yeah. Like, we, they're not because they were still dancing in the club. You know yeah, we can't put this long ass battle rap on the radio. You know, right. So we uh, we was hanging out in the clubs more. That's when I started promoting. Probably I was probably like 18, 19. Yeah. and um, we had came up with a song called "I Know You Hear That Whistle." Didn't mm -hmm. mean shit. I don't even know what it means to this day. Like it was like a whistle in the, it was yeah. a whistle in the beat or something. And then we just was dropping about hello random, random anything. It was me checking tweets on there. So it just took off. Like at the time, it was like club seven and stuff was out. Like they was playing it out at yeah. club exchange. They had college night there. I was working for TC promoting and stuff. Like so the song just started going crazy. And then. They all start playing. They start playing on the radio. I'm at I'm like 17 at the time, like 18 at the time. The song was playing on the radio, and after that, it was like, boy, I don't want to not be on the radio. <laughs> so now we gearing all our songs towards something that's great. Like, yeah, that you can play on the radio. Basically, yeah. So now, as I'm getting older now, like I we done had so much commercial success doing that. Like I done learned the formula of doing that. I'm getting away from what I really usually be on. Right. So now we making so many songs. We done been on the radio back to back years since mm -hmm. from the time we were 17. Like we went in all the competitions. Like they had remix competition for songs that was out. Like Gorilla Zell songs. We went in that. Yeah. You had that competition. It was you. Yeah. I entered on the last day. It was like now it was like a 30 day com competition or something. I called you at the last minute. Like brother, you like now nah, the contest over today. I'm like bro. I just dropped this shit today. Then I won. You like, nah, it, got, it ended this morning. I'm like, oh, nah, I'm about to send you this. I sent it to you and won. Yeah. And then, so, so yeah, so we was on the, we was uh, just doing back to back shit, trying to stay on the radio. And then at the same time, the guys we grew up with, they were taking out like Rasheed Warren and Adrian Brown, they was taking off in the box. And like, we never mm -hmm. knew. Like we always knew they boxed for our whole life, but I never knew like the level we was on yet. Like I never knew that they would when they were saying like, "Yeah, I'm number six in the nation. I'm number this." And like, I ain't know what that meant. Like right, I'm right. still thinking like, "Boy, we in Cincinnati. Boy, you, you gonna box every two months, boy, <laughs> and we gonna keep rapping." Like I'm never knowing that they actually is like number six in the nation for real. Mm -hmm. Like or so at the same time as we were doing this music, they rising on that, and then around that time is where. We made a song, the Mr. Miyagi song, and then... She and Adrian was doing after they won every mm -hmm. fight, and we just basically put a soundtrack to it. Like I made up the hook and stuff, tweets from the beat, and then it just it just went viral. Like it just caught on too crazy. We, we went on tour with it. Like we went all around the country with the song and all that. And at the same time, they they rising and boxing. So like, like it just was it just was crazy. So yeah, that was in the earlier fun days. Like I mean then. 
<laughs> right, yeah, it was really fun, right? Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? yeah. It was a lot. It was a lot of exposure then too. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying for the artists. You know, uh, especially after making a name for themselves, either you know underground or whatever, but making a name of being able to produce good music. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. I remember like when those dropped. I know you hear that was. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And like you said, seven. Uh, yeah, we had clubs that. Thousand yeah. people come to you the club with whistles on and stuff. They run it. Some they play a song. They run around blowing the whistle. They in lines. People come to the club with referee mm-hmm. shirts on and shit. It's crazy. Man. As far as local rappers, like I'm, like I done been through a lot more <laughs> than most of the local rappers. Even you can even tell by the way we carry ourselves. You know, like, yeah. like we out here doing stuff that the industry people are doing. Like uh, all the jewelry and Rolexes and mm-hmm. cars and all that stuff. Like, we got all that stuff like, mm-hmm. without going platinum or none of that. Like these rappers been out here rapping 10, 15 years, saving up for Rolex. That's stuff we have been had. Like 2013, you can go Google us, you can go YouTube us, yeah. crashing phantoms and doing all that roster. Like that shit's been done. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and been through all the, the bad stuff too. So it was like, like we actually was out here having that. We was battling every week. We was finding out who you thought was the best rapper and going to get immediately in their face. Right. <laughs> we was going around entering competitions. We was going around doing talent shows. Then after then after the point where we got to where we took over the city and everybody knows in the city, it started all over again. We mm-hmm. had to go around to the worst places on earth, mm-hmm. doing open mics and chitlin' circuit shit like we all in. Cleveland, Mississippi. I was in Cleveland, Mississippi on my birthday. Mm. Like, I turned 21 in Cleveland, Mississippi. Like, I don't know where the fuck Cleveland, Mississippi is. Like, <laughs> they had one street. <laughs> one street in Cleveland, Mississippi and streets that turned off of it. Like, mm. like nobody, like, rappers today, they're not having to go through that. That's why, that's why they're not, they're not appreciating what it's about or they're not even getting further because they're not actually out here doing the groundwork. Like, we actually, I went to Toledo to the Bash of the Bay. I went to mm-hmm. Columbus, Georgia. We performed at all these festivals and all that. We got in the crowd, handed out CDs, took pictures with people, rapped to people on the spot. Like, right. we, was, we was winning over real physical people and fans and stuff. Like, it wasn't just like sending out text blasts and sending out email blasts and hoping people catch on to your song. Like, it wasn't like that. These guys are signing to, they signing uh, to social media companies and you feel me? Like they, they sign in the companies and look like they're doing nothing, but it's somebody behind the scenes that's making sure they get millions of followers and millions of views and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. But you think they just post the stuff on Instagram, so you post the stuff on Instagram, you're not getting no views, mm-hmm. you're not getting seen, none of that is it's not happening. Because everything, everything with this, this is a business. Like every aspect of this is a business. So, yeah. and, that, and that's what they fail, fail to realize because it's nobody's making it without a team. Mm-hmm. So you and a team isn't four more people that rap too. Like that's not a team. Like you running around with five rappers, y'all going it's not about to happen. Like people, it's people out here that's one rapper and they with seven people that you've never seen. They out here with a PR, they out here with a manager, they out here with a road manager, they out here with somebody that handle their day to day bookings and somebody who do their accounting. Like it's like you don't see all the work that goes into this and it would it wouldn't be this much attention and this much stuff going on if it wasn't that much money in actually in music. Like so y'all just looking at it from the people that's in front of the camera, but it's a meal for every person that's in front of the camera, it's seven, eight people behind the counter. And be behind the camera that's doing real work. So let's talk about like uh, some of the projects that you're doing now. You know what I'm saying? You got the the battles going on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know we coming up almost on the 10th anniversary of the badass battles. Yeah. You know um, that's the platform that we give to all like the more lyrical people in the city and, and the surrounding area too to come do battle raps. People back money. People like people that get big buzz out that stuff and people done got millions of views and stuff on my right. YouTube page from just being in the battles. People done got their music career going from yeah. pumping up off the battles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's your vetting process for when you're doing the battles? Like, well, if, I, if I wanted to get in your next battle, could yeah, I get you guys Like, look, the thing like, with for real. The, like, I used to spit. Yeah, that's cute, <laughs> all that. You can't just come knocking on me, love you, boy. We got, we got, we got something called we got a place called the field first, like so. Uh-huh. So we uh, anybody who wants to get into the battles, we send them to the field first. Mm-hmm. And when you get into the field, 
it's like it's like the real feel. Like you have to go in there and battle it out with guys out there for a few months, mm -hmm. and whoever whoever we see that has stage presence and like, cause anybody can have bars on. You can't tell who writing your bars stuff. But right, right. If you have the delivery, you have the like the star quality and stuff. Mm -hmm. With you, a chance to go to the stage, mm -hmm. and the stage is uh, my guys Vern and Casino. Casino is one of the top battle rappers here. Um, the stage shows you in front of more people. Like the field is more like closed room and right. private and stuff. And then the, the stage it shows you in front of a small crowd or whatever. Then. If you make it out of stage, you're going to the badass battles. And you know, we do like a thousand people there. So, yeah. I mean, it's a process, but we can't just let anybody just come up there. Yeah. How you battle a nigga that don't battle and still lose? Then you quit steak and shake to work at Shell. What the fuck was that, a career move? <laughs> That's a motherfucking gas station, dude. I put you closer to God. I tempt Tebow jeans. They found you still on the scene like I Tebow jeans. He been hurt too many times, y'all, these old jeans. They should call me Levi. I invented you. Without me, it wouldn't be no jeans. He got Danny Granger heart, but I'ma stop it with the heat. He a battle rap nigga. I'ma take away his beat. Leave him laying in the street, shot from his head to feet. Paramedics couldn't bring jeans back with Receipt. I mean, it's good that you had that, that structure. You yeah, because you don't, because it's a lot of things that throw you off in that life. Mm -hmm. Just because you can rap, don't mean that you can perform. Once you can perform, don't mean you can perform in front of people. Like, yeah. I've seen some of the best rappers Fresh. that can rap something in front of me and get in front of a crowd and forget their social security numbers. So. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Then we got, you know, the Cincinnati Riot, Riot series. Yeah. That's just something where I made up so that all the artists could come together even if you didn't know each other or something. It was mm -hmm. a chance for you to work with other people and, right. and y'all could share fans and swap out fan bases and stuff. So we on like the fourth, uh, we're on the fourth installment of the male Cincinnati right now. Right. And I'm doing it for the next generation with all the new rappers like uh, Skylar Black, Day One, mm -hmm. Prince Bob, Midwest Mills. Like we, we I'm, I'm kind of retiring the older guys and bringing out the next wave of the new guys. Like, I'm not even on it, so. Right. Well, I mean, I think that's that's a good look, though. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, even with the people that came out before you. Yeah, you know nobody saying? passed the out. torch. Nobody helped us. Nobody. Like, I ain't one of the older people that's just hating on the new wave. Like, the new wave. Like, I know, like, my wave is me, Scally, and all the people around this mm -hmm. time. Like, but you can't. Nobody that came out before us was trying to do songs with us or. Mm. pull us up or help us or I, I'm not really with that because nobody else could stop or really hinder my shine so it's like you might as well help when you can like right. especially when it's something that's not costing you anything financial or nothing that's hurting you so why yeah. would you not help somebody but you know I, I, I respect that position that you're taking though you know what I'm saying for the simple fact that you're saying like none of the old school cats was trying to work None with of the you. old school music cats, but music like the, cats. Yeah, like you know what the I'm people that was in positions of power, like Big Greg and you feel me. Mm -hmm. You guys, y'all was y'all was doing stuff for us, but like right. they don't even have that now. Like they, yeah. they ain't nobody doing the stuff you was doing back in the day, like throwing competitions for somebody. That you make the best remix of the song that's popping right now, and mm -hmm. I'll play your song on the radio. And, and none of that's going on. Like the radio stations now, it's to the point where. It's like 10 songs in rotation, the same 10 songs being played 300 times a day. It ain't really, <laughs> you don't even have a chance to get heard from your city unless you the super upper echelon and, and by the time your song get on the radio, it's two, three years old to everybody here, they don't even want to hear it. So right. like, I don't know. I mean, uh, and I had a couple of conversations with uh, a couple of different artists and people in the industry in terms of like, that Cincinnati sound mm -hmm. is not represented on the radio. Like in I mean, cities. it is now because people are stealing it. So, but it's like, <laughs> it's like we can't even, we not even at the point where we can defend ourselves. Like mm -hmm. a person like, like a new artist like Gunna is coming out right now, but mm -hmm. all the styles he's, he's stealing directly from people like Cook, like Cook with Flair. Like, mm -hmm. He actually hears this guy's music. He actually done reached out, talked to him, everything. Every time Cook puts out a CD, Gonna put out a CD after and got his whole style and wave on that. Mm. So it's like, but it's like you can't even defend yourself because like we don't have the outlets here 
or not stuff to do that. So and now it's like it's not like in the back in the days where people used to be like, yeah, somebody stole that from me, and people are like, man, nobody heard you. Like, nah, we all on the same outlets now. We all yeah. on my mixtape. My yeah. the my mixtapes that I'm on the front page of is no different than. The my mixtape that Young Thug is on the page, front page of Young mm -hmm. Yo Gotti. Like, if they on the front page with you, there's a good chance that they seeing your music too. Yeah. And if you don't got the what, you don't have the same voice that they have. They can take stuff from you and do what they want with it. So, I mean, let's talk about that voice, the the Cincinnati sound. How would you mm -hmm. describe it? I mean, I don't know, cause in Cincinnati right now, I feel like we got some of the most versatile sounds. Like it's like it's probably 25 different styles here. Mm -hmm. Like we like a melting pot because yeah. it's so, we right in the middle of everything and there's so much different stuff going on. So you might have people that got Chicago influence on their music, some people that got Atlanta style, some people got Memphis mm -hmm. style, some people got a whole style that you've never heard that's basically just from Cincinnati. Like just like like Scally and the downtown people like so it's mm -hmm. like you don't know, like some people influenced by East Coast, like more lyrical and everything. And some people just make up a new style with a combination of all of them. Mm -hmm. Like we we've been listening to a lot of Detroit music, so yeah. everything we do got like it's still us, but we got like outside influence of what we listen to the most. But we right in the middle of everything, so we ah, yeah. listening to everything. And I, I, I for real, I feel like you know our position is a lot better than other cities. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because we have that exposure yeah. to other music, and we're not and we're not really limited. We're not really yeah. limited to one thing, like. Like you know, you go in Louisiana, you know kind of what it where it, right. it's two three styles going on right there. Mm -hmm. Atlanta is probably two three styles that everybody running with right now. Mm -hmm. Since we right here with it, like we we north, we next to the north, we next to the east, we next to St. Right. Louis, we next to like <laughs> so I don't know. It's like it's, like I said, it's like a melting pot of all the different styles. Yeah. So um, stuff that you got going on in the future, man. Uh, I'm working on probably like three or four projects, like. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I'm doing like a, uh, I'm doing a project with a bunch of features and stuff around here with all the people that I did songs with. I'm working on like two, three solo projects. I'm working on um, probably food and drink too. Mm -hmm. I'm working on a more lyrical project called Right and Wrong. So that's gonna be with more like the older sample beats and like right. the Kanye sound and stuff. And I'm uh, working on one called JPay. Uh, so I don't know. I'm just trying to stock up on music and have enough to I never really had enough like I, I only rap when necessary like I, I wasn't one of the rappers that was going to the studio every week like, right so now I'm trying to build up my catalog and do more of that because it's actually paying off for me right now so so why you feel this is necessary for you now I mean because now it's not to the like my whole life I was chasing like trying to get to the industry like like it was a real place like yeah I need to get in the game mm. but now I got it set up to where I can make five six thousand dollars a month off just one CD and the, the revenue that comes out that. So if I be more consistent with it, I can get it to the point where it's ten thousand dollars a month or something like so. It all depends on what's making it to you. So if it's to the point where I'm making ten, twelve thousand dollars a month off just off Spotify and off JPay and off of iTunes and Apple Music and stuff, and again outside features and shows and stuff, yeah. that's making it to me. If I get to fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a month right. <laughs> and I, I'm only doing music and right. I don't. I don't have a job or none of that. Like, boy, that is that's a good look. Fucking making it to me. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Everybody, I don't know. What, I don't know how everybody else judge it, but I got outside stuff going on too at the yeah. same time. So if I'm throwing events and battles and we're still doing the boxing, mm -hmm. we got huge boxing uh, events coming up and stuff. So I'm just trying to make it more and more beneficial every year. Try to go up higher than I did the last year. Yeah. Now you said earlier, like you you view yourself more as a lyrical artist. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? With this next project that you're working on. Um, like all my recent projects have been more like that. Like That's why I've kind of- Well like, like compared to like your earlier yeah, stuff? Yeah, because that's, that's why, that's why I kind of like set out on my own for real. Like mm -hmm. I haven't been in no groups or none of that now because like I, I don't even want to have to debate with somebody on which way to go. I want full creative control on how and now it's like it's not like the old days. Like they're not playing anymore. Like yeah. and people ain't more. They really not on no club stuff. They really with the real life, and they want to hear what's going on and what yeah. they can relate to. And I've been through all that, and still going through all that yeah. that they're going through. So it's and that that music stands the test of time more anyway. So yeah, definitely. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I listen to music that I did ten years ago, 
for the club and stuff, and I, it, it's annoying to me. Like I don't even want to hear it. Mm. But I listen to music where I was actually going through something. I was talking about it, and it'll never get old because at some point somebody out there going through the same thing you went through. Nothing yeah. that we do in, at any time is new. Like you right. might think you're the new guy doing all this. Right. Somebody already did everything you went through. Yeah, my pops used, uh, has this saying like it's nothing new under the sun. You know what I'm saying? Anytime mm-hmm. I try to do something, he'd be like, yo, we was doing that, you know what I'm saying, 20, 30 years. Yeah, ago, for you know sure. It's just, it was different, just, it's just a different scene. Different, you know different clothes, <laughs> different trends, but it's the same, it's the same thing that's going on. So, like, with that lyrical connection that you are putting into your music to connect with your, you know, your following and everything like that, what can they expect? I mean... They can just expect the truth. They can expect detail, anything mm-hmm. that you want to know mm-hmm. about what's going on from the highs to the lows. I'm going right. to let you know what's going on. All right, so let me ask you this. Uh, best moment? Best moment yeah. in rap or in my life? Like, let's let's do both. Got, my life is some shit. <laughs> you don't even know. Like, you got to think. Like, like, my life is so crazy. Like, my life is so crazy that I have to downplay it to people because they're going to think it's fake. Mm. <laughs> like, it done really been a 24 hour period where I got a been in Westwood, got a tour with some people, like, that had an actual shootout in Westwood, go downtown, meet up with Adrian and them at the Hyatt, we go out to a steak dinner at night, leave there, get a private jet to Miami because you got to go to court in the morning. We get to Miami that night, go to the club, go to the strip club, wake up, go to court, leave the strip club, take a private jet to Floyd House, be in Las Vegas sitting on Floyd couch, arguing with the people that we had to shoot out with at home in Cincinnati, you <laughs> And then go outside, give them a Rolls Royce. And, like, it's just hella weird, like my shit different than everybody. Some people, you just got to tell them, like, this ain't it, man. Yeah. Some people would have took that money and stood there. I had an eight-hour session with him. We was three hours in. Mm-hmm. I gave him every dollar back. Like, mm-hmm. it wasn't even like I'm taking three hours a month. No, I'm right. giving you this. So this is a gift from me to you. Mm-hmm. This is not it for you. I wonder why I'm getting all this shit. Stay 